a very good evening aspirants welcome to hindu news analysis brought to you by shankar ias academy today is 10th of april 2022 the list of articles we are going to discuss today is displayed on the screen here you can see the first article is an faq article it is regarding ipcc and this article discussion we will briefly revise about ipcc and we will discuss about the key findings of the report then we will also see the implications of ipcc report on india and in the second news article we will discuss about micro swimmers and how it will be helpful in targeted drug delivery and in the third article we will discuss about the causes symptoms and effects of parkinson's disease and then we will discuss about what is ground level ozone and upper atmospheric ozone and then in this fifth article we will see what is spinosaurus in prelims perspective and then we will conclude our discussion by solving four preliminary practice questions so without wasting much time let's start our discussion now look at this faq article this article talks about the latest ipcc report that is intergovernmental panel on climate change report to be specific it talks about the working group 3 report which is part of the 6th assessment report of ipcc the title of this report is climate change 2022 mitigation of climate change The article here covers three aspects. First, it covers the methodology on how this report is prepared. Second, it covers the major findings of the report and finally it covers the implication of this report for India. See, the methodology on how this report is prepared is not very relevant for our exams. So in this discussion, first let us see some important points about IPCC. This will be very useful for your prelims examination. then we will look at the major findings of this report and finally we will discuss about the implication of the report for india so this is the plan for this news article discussion now before getting into the discussion the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it now let us start the discussion first a small introduction about ipcc for the prelims note that ipcc or the intergovernmental panel on climate change is the united nations body for assessing the science related to climate change when was it created it was created in 1988 by the world meteorological organization and the united nation environment program now why was it created the ipcc was created to provide policy makers with regular scientific assessments on climate change through this specific assessments The IPCC provides the implications and potential future risks associated with climate change. In addition to this, through these reports, the IPCC put forward adaptation and mitigation options that are available for the governments around the world. Also note here that the IPCC reports are a key input to international climate change negotiations. Now, who are the members of IPCC? Note that Currently the IPCC has 195 member countries the member countries of IPCC are either members of United Nations or members of the World Meteorological Organization now who prepares the report of IPCC look at this image here this is the general organizational structure of the IPCC in this you can find three working groups right these working groups prepares the assessment report and the special reports of the ipcc each working group will be looking at a different aspect of the science related to climate change for example the working group 1 looks at the aspect of the physical science basis and the working group 2 looks into impacts adaptation and vulnerability and the working group 3 works on mitigation of climate change for example the report data that we are going to see today is by the working group 3 this is why the title of the report is climate change 2022 mitigation of climate change here you can find another part of the ipcc that is the task force on national greenhouse gas inventories and what does this task force do see its main objective is to develop and refine a methodology for the calculation and reporting of national greenhouse gas emissions and removals then there is also the technical support unit which is mentioned here as tsu the activities of each working group and the task force are supported by their individual technical support units now i hope we have covered all the basics regarding ipcc having done this let us come back to the article as i said the article contains several important findings of the report 
Now look at these findings. First look at this graph. From this graph, you can see that the global net anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have been increasing since 1990. The trend is similar for the last decade. Between 2010 to 2019 also, the global net anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions has continued to increase. What other data can you get by observing this graph? See, we can observe the rate of increase. The rate of growth of global net anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions between 2010 and 2019 was lower than that of between 2000 and 2009. This may be the only positive data from this report. Next, from the graph, you can see that by 2019, the largest growth in absolute emission occurred in carbon dioxide from fossil fuels and industry. This is followed by methane. So, in the coming years, in addition to efforts to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from the fossil fuels, efforts must also be made to reduce methane emissions. The main reason for the increase in carbon dioxide emission from fossil fuels and industry is that emission reductions in carbon dioxide from fossil fuels and industrial processes due to the improvements in energy intensity of GDP and carbon intensity of energy have been less than emission increase from rising global activity levels in industry, energy supply, transport, agriculture and buildings. To put it in simple words, Although through innovations we have improved the efficiency of our cars and industries, the gain achieved from this innovation is less than emission increase due to global economic activity. Okay? Now look at these graphs. The per unit cost of several low emission technologies have fallen continuously since 2010. From the graph, you can see that the maximum fall in per unit cost is witnessed in photovoltaics and batteries for passenger electric vehicles. Due to fall in price, the adoption of renewable energy has increased. Just look at these graphs. Except concentrating solar power, that is CSP, in all other renewable resources has shown a rapid jump in adoption post-2010. This is due to the significant push for renewable energy by the governments all around the world. The report also mentioned that innovation has lagged in developing countries due to weak enabling conditions. We know that in the Conference of Parties 21, that is COP21, which was held in Paris, the world nations agreed to limit global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius and preferably limit to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. And we know that the concept of NDC, that is Nationally Determined Contributions, was also introduced in COP21. The report here says that even if countries adhere to their promises made through NDCs, global warming will still exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius during the 21st century itself. And if this happens, limiting global warming below 2 degrees Celsius will become a very difficult task. Next, the report says that the global temperature will stabilize when carbon dioxide emission reach net zero. That is, for limiting global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius, we have to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emissions globally in early 2050. And for limiting global temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius, we have to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emission globally in early 2070. Next, we will see about the finances related to climate change. Look at this pie chart. From the pie chart, you can see that climate change received 161 billion US dollars. In this, the majority went to mitigation. That is, 116 billion US dollars went to mitigation and then adaptation received only 45 billion US dollars. And you guys know the difference between mitigation and adaptation, right? If you know the difference, post it in the comment section. Now coming back, from the figure given here, you can also see that 94% of the total funding came from public sources. So, efforts must be made to ramp up private funding. Now look at this data here. This figure shows the funding required for mitigation of climate change. Here, data is given for various sectors, economy and region. Here look at the fund flow for mitigation efforts by the type of economy. Here the blue bar represents the average fund flow and the grey bar represents the annual mitigation needs. From the data given here, we can clearly see that 
the average mitigation related fund flows are almost similar for both the developed countries and the developing countries but the average mitigation investment needed is high for developing countries compared to the developed countries so in essence the developing countries are facing a deficit in funding related to climate change mitigation efforts so these are some important data from the working group 3 report finally before concluding let us see the implications of the report for india first is regarding coal power plant the report warned that all coal fired power plants without the technology to capture and store carbon would need to be shuttered by 2050 so this will help the world to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degree celsius india currently accounts for 10 percentage of global coal powered energy generation according to the central electricity authority india had about 211 gigawatts of operational coal fired power plants In addition to this another 31 gigawatts was being constructed and about 24 gigawatt in various pre-construction phases I note that none of the existing and under construction coal fired power plants in India have carbon capture and store facilities that is CCS facilities for the world to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degree celsius the contribution from india must be significant but india needs these coal fired power plants to satisfy its energy needs now how india balances these needs will be interesting to watch and india claims historical responsibility for climate change from fossil fuel rested with the developed countries so it is ethical that the developed countries take on a large portion of the mitigation burden we saw that the average mitigation investment needed is high for developing countries so according to india the developed countries can provide funds for mitigation efforts in developing countries due to their historical responsibility our government has indeed welcomed the report and said it recognizes india's position that developed countries must do more to mitigate climate change that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about ipcc which is the united nation body for assessing the science related to climate change it was created in 1988 by world meteorological organization and unep then we have seen some important findings of the report we have seen that the global net anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have been increasing since 1990 and the report said that even if countries adhere to their promises made through ndcs global warming will still exceed 1.5 degree celsius during the 21st century itself next we have seen that the global temperature will stabilize when carbon dioxide emissions reach net zero then we have seen about climate funding the majority of the funding went to mitigation and less funds were allocated for adaptation and we also saw that 94% of the total funding came from public sources then we have seen the implication of the report for india the report warned that all coal fired power plants without the technology to capture and store carbon would need to be shuttered by 2050 and india claims historical responsibility for climate change from fossil fuels rested with the developed countries so india insists that the developed countries should take on a larger portion of the mitigation burden so that's all regarding this faq article discussion now we will move on to next news article discussion Look at this news article. This news article talks about microbots or micro swimmers. These microbots are used in drug delivery. First of all, what is the need for targeted drug delivery? See, the prominent problem associated with medicine today is that good drugs often distribute equally into diseased and healthy cells. When drugs accumulate in healthy cells, they often cause toxicity. For example, consider cancer treatment. In recent years we have made huge advances in cancer treatment although the efficiency of chemotherapy and radiation therapy has increased leaps and bounds while undergoing such treatments our healthy cells along with cancer cells are also affected this makes cancer treatment one of the most painful journeys this is why scientists are working for targeted drug delivery so here microswimmers becomes important Now coming back to the article microswimmers are nothing but microscopic objects with the ability to move in liquid environment natural microswimmers are found everywhere in the natural world as biological microorganisms such as bacteria archaea and micro animals 
Since the turn of the 21st century, scientists and engineers have begun to develop artificial analogs to natural microswimmers. Artificial microswimmers are comparable in size to bacteria and they are typically 1 to 10 micrometer. These artificial microswimmers can also propel themselves through liquids. But developing an artificial microswimmer is not an easy task. To understand this, I want you to imagine like you are trying to swim in water. What you do to create a forward motion is that you push the water backwards. That is, you are imparting backward momentum to the fluid. Now consider yourself swimming in a highly viscous fluid like honey. Any effort to push backwards and then generate forward motion would be hindered by the high viscosity of the honey, right? So, as the viscosity increases, the normal methods we use to generate forward motion that is imparting backward momentum becomes difficult. And at microscopic level, where these artificial microswimmers are employed, the viscosity is very high. So, scientists employ a variety of methods to achieve forward motion. The method discussed in this article uses light energy to achieve forward motion. See, the microswimmers discussed in this article are made from a two-dimensional compound. The compound used is PHI carbon nitride, that is polyheptazine amide carbon nitride. These microswimmers range from 1 to 10 micrometer. They can self-propel when energized by shining light. Now, how do these microswimmers use light energy to propel themselves? The PHI carbon nitride is a polycatalytic substance. Here, polycatalytic is nothing but a substance that gets excited due to the presence of light energy. When light is incident on them, they generate electrons and holes. Here, electrons are negatively charged and holes are positively charged. The charges that get developed in the microswimmers will react with the fluid surrounding them. This reaction combined with the particle's electric field makes the microboat swim. The added advantage of this technology is that since they are propelled using light energy, the light energy can be used to direct the way in which the microswimmers move. So, they can be used in targeted drug delivery. See, if you found this section to be a bit technical and difficult to understand, don't worry. UPSC will never ask what is the material used for making microswimmer or write about how microswimmers move using light energy. For our examination, we can expect the questions from the application part. Look at this image here. Here, all the biomedical applications of this technology are given. You can pause the video and have a look at it. This is what is important for your exams. With this, let us conclude this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about microswimmers, which are nothing but microscopic objects with the ability to move in liquid environment. And we also saw that natural microswimmers are found everywhere in the natural world, such as bacteria, archaea, perm, and micro animals. Then we have seen the image of the biomedical applications of this technology. This is very important. So that's all regarding this news article. Now we will move on to next news article discussion. Look at this news article. This news article talks about the awareness on Parkinson's disease. See, Apollo hospitals organized an awareness meeting on Parkinson's disease. This awareness meeting was organized ahead of the World Parkinson's Day which is on 11th of April, that is on tomorrow. So in this context, let us discuss about the Parkinson's disease in prelims perspective. Like we will cover the causes, symptoms and effects of Parkinson's disease, okay? See, Parkinson's disease is a common chronic degenerative disorder of the central nervous system. Note that it is a disabling disease of the aging population and affects their mobility and locomotion. So, it is classified as a movement disorder. See, Parkinsonian syndromes can be divided into two types according to their origin. The first type is the primary or idiopathic type. Here, the cause of cell death is not fully understood. And the second type is secondary or acquired type. Here, the disease can be linked to various kinds of affecting agents such as drugs, toxins, infection, tumor, etc. See, idiopathic Parkinson's disease can have a hereditary basis or it can be sporadic in nature. Sporadic in the sense, it is occurring at irregular intervals or only in few places or scattered or isolated. Now let us look at the symptoms of this disease. See, here you can see the symptoms. They are slow movements, 
rigidity, slow reaction time, frequent falls, Parkinsonian gait and face masking. See here, gait means a person's manner of walking and face masking means an expressionless face with little or no sense of animations. Okay. Now let us see the causes of Parkinson's disease. See, this disease is caused by a loss of nerve cells in the part of the brain called the substantia nigra. Note that nerve cells in this part of the brain are responsible for producing a chemical called dopamine. And this dopamine acts as a messenger in the nervous system and helps control and coordinate body movements. If these nerve cells become damaged, the amount of dopamine in the brain is reduced. This means that the part of the brain which is controlling the movement cannot work so well and it causes the movements to become slow and abnormal. See, the loss of nerve cells is a slow process and the level of dopamine in the brain falls over a period of time. Only when 80% of the nerve cells in the substantia nigra have been lost, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease appear and gradually become more severe. And most people with Parkinson's disease have idiopathic disease. That is, they have no specific known cause. Now, there are certain factors associated with Parkinson's disease. The first one is familial factors. Here, the disease occurrence will be in small number of patients. Now, second is the environment factors, which includes pesticide exposure, head injuries, and air pollution related to road traffic. Now, having seen the symptoms and causes, now just look at this image to know how the disease gets worsened in each and every stage. From this, you can understand the effects of the Parkinson's disease. See, in the first stage, the people affected by the disease will develop mild symptoms but will be able to do day-to-day -day work. In the second stage, the symptoms get worsened and in the third stage, the movement begins to slow down which results in loss of balance. And in the fourth stage, symptoms will be severe and cause significant issues with the day-to-day -day living. Here the people affected will be unable to live alone and will need care. And in the final stage, walking or standing may be impossible and people are often confined to a wheelchair or bed. So that's all regarding Parkinson's disease. Now we will do a quick recap. See, we have seen that Parkinson's disease is a common chronic degenerative disorder of the central nervous system. It is a disabling disease of the aging population and affects their mobility and locomotion. And we have then seen two types of Parkinsonian syndromes. They are primary or idiopathic type and secondary or acquired type. Then we have seen that this syndrome is caused by a loss of nerve cells in the part of the brain called the substantia nigra. Then we have concluded by discussing the five stages of Parkinson's disease. That's all regarding this news article. Now we will move on to next news article discussion. Look at this news article. This news article talks about the major impact of ozone on climate change. See the level of ozone in the upper and the lower atmosphere were responsible for nearly one third of the warming of waters. Here I mean the waters which borders Antarctica. This study was published in Nature Climate Change. So in this context, let us discuss about the ozone in the ground level as well as in the upper atmospheric level. This will be very useful for your problems. See, first of all, what is ozone? See, ozone that is O3 is a triatomic allotrope of oxygen. That is a form of oxygen in which the molecule contains three atoms instead of two as in the common form. I am repeating it again. Ozone is a form of oxygen in which the molecule contains three atoms instead of two as in the common form. See, ozone is an irritating pale blue gas that is explosive and toxic even at low concentrations. So, it is a highly reactive gas. Now, let us see where all it will be present. See, ozone is both a natural and a man-made product. It occurs in the Earth's upper atmosphere that is in the stratosphere and in the lower atmosphere that is in the troposphere. See, Depending on where it is in the atmosphere, ozone affects the life on earth in either good or bad ways. Now let us see how. First, let us talk about the stratospheric ozone. See, the stratospheric ozone is formed naturally through the interaction of solar ultraviolet radiation with molecular oxygen. This ozone layer above the earth's surface reduces the amount of harmful UV radiation reaching the earth's surface. Okay, now let us talk about the tropospheric or ground level ozone. 
See, the tropospheric or ground level ozone is not emitted directly into the air, but it is created by chemical reactions between oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compounds. This happens when pollutants emitted by cars, power plants, industrial boilers, refineries, chemical plants and other sources chemically react in the presence of sunlight. Okay. See, ozone is most likely to reach unhealthy levels on hot sunny days. That too in urban environment. Note that ozone can also be transported long distances by wind. So even rural areas can experience high ozone levels. Okay. So that's all regarding ozone. We have seen that ozone is a triatomic allotrope of oxygen. That is a form of oxygen in which a molecule contains three atoms instead of two. Then we have seen about stratospheric ozone. It is formed naturally through the interaction of solar ultraviolet radiation with molecular oxygen. This forms the ozone layer above the earth's surface. This reduces the amount of harmful UV radiation reaching the earth's surface. Okay. Then we have seen about tropospheric or ground level ozone. It is not emitted directly into the air but it is created by chemical reaction between oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compounds. So that's all regarding this news article. Now we will move on to next news article discussion. Now look at this article. This news article talks about the spinosaurs. See, it has been found that the spinosaurs and its skin had dense bone walls and this was similar to a penguin. This suggests that it spent lot of time in the water and hunted in it. Also, researchers compared the spinosaurid's bones with an array of living and extinct marine mammals, aquatic reptiles and water loving birds. They found that the spinosaurs could swim underwater. So in this context, let us discuss about the spinosaurs in prelims perspective. Okay? See, the spinosaurs belongs to the family Spinosauridae. It is known from incomplete North African fossils that date to Cenomanian times that is roughly 100 to 94 million years ago. See, Spinosaurus is also called Pined Reptile. It was named so for its sail back feature created by tall vertebral spines. Note that the related taxa in the family Spinosauridae include Baryonyx from England, Irritator from Brazil and Suchomimus from Niger. Note that Spinosaurus is longer and heavier than Tyrannosaurus. This Spinosaur is the largest known carnivorous dinosaur. It possesses the skull which is roughly 6 feet long, a body length of 14 to 18 meters and an estimated mass of 12,000 to 20,000 kilograms. Like other Spinosaurids, Spinosaurs possessed nostrils near the eyes instead of near the end of snout. Its teeth are straight and conical instead of curved and blade like as in other theropods. All these features are adaptations for pisciori, that is consumption of fish. In addition, the bones of its skeleton were more compact and denser than those of similar land dwelling theropods, which allowed its greater control over its buoyancy underwater. This characteristic has led some researchers to argue that Pinosaurus was primarily an aquatic predator rather than a terrestrial one. So that's all regarding this news article discussion. With these all key points, now let's move on to next part of our news article discussion, which is nothing but preliminary practice question discussion. Now look at the first question. Consider the following statements with reference to Parkinson's disease. It is an acute degenerative disorder of the central nervous system. Statement 2, it affects mobility and locomotion. Statement 3, they can be easily diagnosed using x-ray machines. And you have to find the correct statement. See here, statement 1 is incorrect because it is a chronic degenerative disorder of the central nervous system. It is not an acute disorder. And regarding statement 2, it is correct. It affects mobility and locomotion. This fact we have seen in our discussion, right? And regarding statement 3, it is incorrect. Because diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is essentially a clinical diagnosis from information derived from medical history and neurological examination. There is no imaging or laboratory test that can identify the disease. Brain scans are sometimes used to rule out disorders that could give rise to similar symptoms. So here statement 1 is incorrect, 2 is correct and 3 is incorrect. So our final answer is option B, 2 only. Now look at the second question. Which of the following are the potential applications of light activated micro swimmers? Statement 1, environmental remediation. Statement 2, hydrogen evolution. Statement 3, targeted drug delivery. 
now you have to find the correct statement see here all the statement are correct here environmental remediation means removal of pollutants or contaminants from water and soil light activated micro swimmers can be used in potential environmental remediation for active photocatalytic degradation of methylene blue and uh, hydrogen evolution is nothing but a production of hydrogen through the process of water electrolysis here also light activated micro swimmers are used and uh, we discussed today that they are also used in targeted drug delivery in addition to the biomedical application of micro swimmers that i have displayed as part of the discussion note down these applications also so here the correct answer is option d all the above now look at the third question consider the following statements with reference to ozone ozone is formed only in the stratosphere statement 2 Reduction in stratospheric ozone causes several harm to human beings, animals, etc. We have to find the correct statement. See here, statement 1 is incorrect because ozone is formed both in stratosphere and troposphere. And statement 2, it is correct because stratospheric ozone protects harmful UV radiation from reaching the earth's surface. Thus, reduction in stratospheric ozone causes several harm to human beings. For example, it might lead to skin cancer. So our final answer is option B, 2 only. Now look at the last question for today's discussion. Consider the following statements with reference to spinosaurs. They are carnivore dinosaur. Statement 2, they are longer and heavier than tyrannosaurs. Which of the following statements are correct? See here, both the statements are correct. They are carnivore dinosaur and we saw in our discussion that they have certain adaptations which enable them to eat fish. And statement 2, yes, they are longer and heavier than Tyrannosaurus. It is a fact. So here the correct answer will be option C, both 1 and 2. The main question is displayed here. Write your answer and post it in the comment section. If you like the video, hit the like button, post your comments and share the video with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.